Reflective Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Fully Reflective Podcast. I have two incredible guests with me tonight, my father, Theodore, and my mentor, Stephen, and we're here to talk about the one and only Wayne Kramer. I recently learned deeper about how Steve had this relationship with him, but dad, first you go, what was your connection and relationship with this legend, Wayne Kramer? Well, first of all, um, I'm honored to even talk about the great man because, uh, I don't think, or I don't think, I know for a fact that the rest of the world has no idea the full impact, capabilities, aura, genius, musical force, and just humanity that is and will forever be Wayne Kramer. Uh, we were both born in Detroit in 1948. We didn't know each other. We're not aware of each other because we were consumed with pursuing Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and Little Richard musicality. And we both coincidentally, unbeknownst to us, took guitar lessons from the great Joe Podorsik at the Capitol School of Music on Grand River, started in the early 50s as young boys. And I, I know his perspective and his trajectory because we've talked about it for 50 years. And... Joe Podorsik was a part-time Motown funk brother, paid, played bass with James Jamerson and Bob Babbitt, the foundational bass gods of the bass guitar on more hit records than anybody but maybe the Wrecking Crew. In fact, certainly more than the Wrecking Crew out of California. But uh, we pursued our little combos. I don't even think we knew the name of a group it was called a band. It wasn't called a band yet. It was either a duo or a or a trio or a combo, because we were just starting out playing guitar as pre-teenagers, um, exploring the uncharted world that Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley had uh, opened up guitar-wise. Of course, the Ventures and eventually the the uh, Beach Boys, but mostly Dwayne Eddy and uh, um, Lonnie Mack and uh, Link Ray. These are important names to know because they introduced us to B.B. King, Freddie King, Albert King, going all the way back to Mose Allison, Howling Wolf, um, uh, Robert Johnson. We weren't aware of that, probably Wayne more than me, because I was already consumed with Chuck and Bo. So, do you remember the Do you remember the first memory you had meeting Wayne? Yes. Well, I'll get to that, but it's important to note that um, we were both baptized by this new electric guitar. And the cravings of making that music as the guitar gods of Chuck and Bo introduced us to. So uh, so I got the Lourdes. We won the Battle of the Bands. I don't know where the MC5 was during the Battle of the Bands. There probably wasn't an MC5. I think it was a different band uh, by uh, 1962 when we won the Battle of the Bands and opened up for the Supremes and the Bo Brummos. So the Lourdes were on a high-velocity upwards trajectory. I don't know what Wayne was doing. I wasn't aware of Wayne Kramer at the time. But then uh, my dad got transferred to Chicago. So I moved to Chicago. I had to leave the Lourdes, the number one band in Michigan in the Midwest. And I was just turned 16. So I started the Amboy Dukes. And when I came back after graduating from high school in 67, um, I wasn't aware of the Detroit music scene per se, except for Mitch Wright and the Detroit Wheels, who would change their names from Billy Lee and the Rivieras. But as soon as the Amboy Duke started playing the Crow's Nest East, the Crow's Nest West, the Crow's Nest North, the Crow's Nest South, and the Birmingham Teen Center, and the Palladium, and the Hullabaloo, and the Shindig, and the Grandy Ballroom, and the and the Mump uh, at the at the first mall in America, <laughs> the Northland Mump, uh, Northland Mall. We played at the Mump. We were the house band for the Mump. <laughs> it was awesome. It was just uncharted juvenile exuberance of vinity. And then we played the Grandy Ballroom. And I was getting turned on to Grand Funk Railroad. Um, I don't think Grand Funk was around yet. Um, but certainly Dick Wagner and the Frost, the Scott Richardson case, the Rationals, unbelievable. Um, and the Brownsville Station, phenomenal. And we went to the Grandy Ballroom for our first gig and we played with the MC5. Holy shit. Because we aspired to be James Brown and as tight as the Funk Brothers and as energetic as Little Richard, and we were. Plus, we were not just limited to rock and roll, the Chuck Berry chord changes and, and cadence. We also, I just talked to Andy Solomon today, we also interjected some chords that we made up and some movement, da, 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 playing horn parts on the guitar. And then I saw the MC5. 
I thought we were powerful, tight, dynamic, exciting, loud and soft and big loud again, multiple crescendos and orgasms per song. And then Rob Tyner yelled, kick out the jams, motherfuckers! And all of a sudden, Fred Smith and Dennis Thompson on drums and Michael Davis on the bass and Wayne Kramer doing the James Brown one leg dance across the stage. I went, boy, I thought we were bad motherfuckers, but wait a minute, Mr. Postman. These guys are a firestorm of not, it, and, and I'm taking this point, point now, Steve, because you didn't see that. Nobody, I don't think any anybody saw it. There were a bunch of us saw it, but I think I was the only one who really uh, digested what I was seeing because I was the only guy cleaning this over, to my knowledge. Now, I'm not knocking other people that were absorbing it to their personal degree and desires, but I was so radar because I was clean and sober, and all of a sudden I'm hearing James Brown and Wilson Pickett and the Funk Brothers and tightness from these teenage white guys, and Rob Tyner actually looked like the Tasmanian devil, and he crescendoed every verse, and he'd hit the stage on his knees, and I was already into showman. I'm jumping off amps, and I'm wearing loincloths, and I'm hitting the stage, and I'm feeding back, and I'm I'm looking like I sound and I was developing a reputation for high energy and outrage and stage uh, athleticism. But what a sucker punch to the musical solar plexus we got. I, I promise you, Steve and Rocco, Bob Seeger and the last herd at the time, the Rationals, awesome. Um, Scott Richard Case, awesome. Brownsville Station, awesome. Cub Coda real McCoy, like a little bispectacled nerd, but playing Freddie King stuff authoritatively. But Rob Tyner's front man soulfulness and over-the-top screaming, the tightness of that band playing It's a Man's World by James Brown and Fred and, and Wayne playing the violin parts, the cello parts. So it was not just blue cheer, I constantly love blue cheer, but um, I want dynamics. I want soulfulness. I want groove. I want to get that pocket, Motown, Funk Brother, James Brown pocket. And I met him that night, and and it was a cursory, you know, drive-by, how do you do? Um, I'm sure I said great stuff about him. He said stuff, stuff about the Amboy Dukes. Says, we were the, we were the, we're the bad boys in town. We're the first guys. So, ever. so he, so so he had he had awareness of you at that point. Oh yeah, well, you, you could not. I mean, the Amboy Dukes were taking the the city by storm, and again, that was manifested that we were the first band to record nationally and get the Amboy Dukes with "Baby Please Don't Go" had the first national hit of all those bands. Um, and we could go into the details of why that happened, but you might be looking at them. Uh, but yeah, we had a a, a drive by um, encounter. Um, uh, highwaymen, how do you do in a guitar tone comments? But that developed over the years, Rocco and Steve, um, after his trajectory uh, petered out because of substance abuse, which I blame. I blame the individuals and, and John Sinclair, their so-called manager, um, who was all about dope. It's all it was about. And all of a sudden, um, I'm, I'm giving you a, a capitalization here of, of uh, years, but by 69, they'd lost it. And I was, everybody was heartbroken. I mean, shit, they should have been a monster. I mean, because they were a monster. I can't, I can't, I am the master of painting a picture with words. I can't paint an accurate picture of how good these guys were. How authoritative and musically, you know, the people comparing to the punk bands like the Stooges. No, don't ever do that. The Stooges were, they, on a scale of one to 10, Fred was a 10, Wayne was a 10, Dennis was a 10, Michael was a 10, Rob was a 20. And the Stooges bumped into four and five once in a while because uh, they just didn't pursue the tightness of the black heroes, the rhythm and blues, the Motown, James Brown, especially, because we all played James Brown songs. Uh, so don't ever lump the five in with punk bands. They they were masterful punks, but they were musical authorities. And you could tell they practiced like motherfuckers. 
And I think the battle cry that I've said in a bunch of interviews about Wayne and the Five is that every band that saw them, I'm sure had meetings and went, we need to practice more. We need to we need to have more dynamics. We need to have the groove better. At least the ones that were sober enough to identify the power of the MC5. But never have they been even closely represented or captured on vinyl or on tape. No, no one will ever know unless you were really clean and sober, 67, 68, maybe early 69, before the drugs destroyed them. No, it was, but it was, and, and and I love Wayne. I love all the guys in the band, but it was another reminder why I shouldn't get high. Um, because I'm watching all my heroes dying or fizzling, and then Wayne went to prison for d d dealing heroin and stuff. Um, and then when he got out of prison, um, I contacted him. We we reignited a friendship that was actually communicable now because we couldn't really talk back then. They were already getting high and they were already, you know, I went to their party sometimes. <laughs> you know, I wanted to talk Chuck Berry. I couldn't get anybody to talk. They were so stoned all the time. And it really pissed me off because I so admired them. I'd like to share the admiration for the influences of those black heroes. And you couldn't talk to them. Um, now maybe um, I'm I'm I, I only have a, a slice of the perspective. Maybe they didn't want to talk to me, but uh, watching them in action after the shows, there was no semblance of communication. So after we got out of prison and cleaned up, his real heart and soul um, emerged as a loving man, a kind man, a generous man, a caring man. And then we started to have communication. We'd meet whenever we play out in California, we'd meet up and uh, get to the hotel room together. And then we started talking the, the musical authority that we had a parallel with Joe Podorsic, same school of music and same music, same songs. We played all the same songs. We played all Chuck, Bo, um, Little Richard, all Motown, um, the Kinks, the, the Yardbirds, um, the, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, um, but then we started writing our own stuff. So that's a, a an encapsulation of our meeting in 67 up until our conversation just a, a couple months ago. And over the years, I think I can summarize it, Steve, this will impress you more than anything, is that whenever we talked, I always said, it's great knowing you, Wayne. I love you. I love our Detroit paths together. And he would always say, I love you too, Ted. So that was the last words I had with Wayne Kramer's that I said, I love you. And he said, I love you back. Awesome. So powerful. Steve, what, what, what does all that make you feel? Uh, like I, I was about to start crying. It's so emotional, you know? I mean, Ted and the five, I mean, that's the the both of them drive my hand when I'm designing like you can't understand you know I mean some of my best designs were done with stranglehold kick out the jams rambling rose I mean some of some of the greats and there's no better song than looking at you you know lyrically and just driving I mean the the way the music drives is like nothing else I've ever experienced in the the I wish you could have seen them, Steve, because you can oh, yeah. only get, you need to expand your imagination of the love you have and the sensations you got from those songs. And I promise you, in your mind, multiply it by a thousand because you didn't see them before they started petering out. It this is an spellbinding. If people so, would stand and I'd watch them and I'd go, holy fuck. Yes, Rob Tyner. He would. They would own the, the the air in the room. Right. I got goosebumps right now watching them. You get Michael Lutz. You get an interview with Michael Lutz because he saw him and he was straight and he he understood it. Some of us understood it. Some of us just went with the flow. They didn't care if it was Blue Cheer or MC Five or the Who. Or, but the five were special. Yeah, now, I Steve. Mean, when did you when when did you meet Steve and get close with? I mean, when did you meet Wayne and, and develop that friendship with? Him? Yeah, it was a couple. It was a couple of years ago. You know, I noticed he was down in L.A. and uh, Margaret saw that we followed him, and 
you know, I just kind of, I just kind of reached out. Like she saw, you know, I would, I would tag MC5, Wayne Kramer, Sonic Smith, you know, everything that I would do because, you know, the, like I said, I mean, I, I'll never forget when I got kick out the jams on vinyl when I was a teenager and was like, what the fuck is this? You know? And then just the, the explosive nature of that band. I grew up in Boston. We had a great music scene, but there's something about Detroit. That's just. There so sure much, is. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just more grit and authenticity. And I don't know. It, it's, it's not so much anger, but there's, there's definitely something about Detroit that that's just so much more amazing than any place else for the music. And, and Wayne see- and I talked about that, and and he, we we would always always communicate that so many of the other bands were inspired by the Stones and the Beatles. We were already playing all that stuff before there was a Stones and the Beatles. Remember, the Stones and the Beatles had Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, and Motown songs on their first albums. We already oh, yeah. knew that before Jagger and Richards even got together. I think. We were doing that in the late 50s. Um, and so we had already built up steam. And then I got to tell you, Billy Lee and the Rivieras that turned into Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels, they established an elevated, unprecedented energy and musicality. Don't underestimate the musicality. And, and the reason you'll never know how great the MC5 were is because their power was so overwhelming that they didn't put a recording team together. And as you know, Steve, if you're going to go in the studio, talk to Tom Worman, they had to take my intensity and and capture it with the right mic, with the right EQ, with the right cable, on the right spot of the speaker, in the right room, with the right things that that absorb the sound, get them out of the studio and get that liveness, uh, John Bonham drums, for example. And nobody got past the overwhelming intoxicating energy of the five to go into those details and nuances. So the the then Bob Ezrin, the master producer, was wrapping up Wayne's new record. And I can't wait to hear that. I've been in touch with uh Tom Morello and 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 uh, uh Jesse Hughes of the uh, uh Eagles of Death Metal. And uh, they were working on that album with Wayne and I and with Bob Ezrin, finally, someone who will take those details. So you capture the bombacity of it. You can't capture a Rob Tyner scream just by using a regular microphone. you got to find the right mic and find the right distance and the right size pantyhose to screen the, the, the popping peas. And you know what I'm talking about in the studio. Bobby. I mean, there's a lot of nuances that when, when with the MC5, you did you couldn't imagine a nuance. My God, here's this avalanche of energy and sound. So they thought they just capture the energy and sound. But it takes master engineers, producer ears. Um, what's that famous uh, producer that did uh, um, uh, the Chili Peppers, the big bearded guy? Rick Rubin. Yeah, Rick, 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 Rick Rubin. He's the guy who understands the power, but then he makes sure he captures the power, technically speaking. Because if you just think you can capture it, even though the police did it on their first album, I think it did it in three days with four mics, um, it, there have been instances where you capture that, but the police weren't the five. And at their volume and at their crescendoing and, and waterfalling, avalanching of sound, you have to have an engineer that knows how to capture that. And we did it on the Ted Nugent albums because of uh, Tom Worman. And all your favorite, and Bob Rock did it with Metallica because you can't just take a monstrosity uh, explosion of sound and just put a mic on it. So uh, I, I'm hoping that something was captured uh, accurately by Bob Ezrin on the new. I don't know if it's a Wayne Kramer solo or if it's an MC5 uh, endeavor, but uh, I'm I'm eagerly anticipating that. Yeah, I'm I know. curious, and de- go go ahead, Steve. Sorry they were talking about it being an mc5 album yeah i think so yeah but yeah. but with uh you know obviously the only living member now is dennis i believe yeah it's wild i gotta get steve, a hold of him. i gotta talk before before steve, one of us. steve I, I, i'm curious steve from your perspective and you got to know wayne and it sounds like his later chapter what's a question that you have maybe for dad about his relationship with him or something your last key memories with wayne yeah, I mean, you know, the main thing is it's 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 refreshing to hear that you guys got along because you're from different political spectrums. And, uh, you know, I think that's what's missing a lot in society today is the 
ability to agree to disagree but still be friends you know and i think that's, well, that's before, before we said i love you and goodbye every time we had these discussions we had the pro-trump anti-trump pro-democrat anti-democrat pro-republican anti-republican pro-constitution uh black uh revolution uh it, 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 but we never raised our voice yeah i would listen i would listen to him till he was done and then he would listen to me till I was done. And we go, well, you know, I just think you're wrong, but I love yeah. you. <laughs> okay. And see, that's okay. I think that's missing from the dialogue. Today. Yes. Everything's so polarized, you know? And, um, you know, I, I look at it as, as music is such a great uniter, you know, it's a, it's a force. It's a force to be reckoned with. Yep. And I think for me, there was no greater force than the MC5. And I think a lot of people don't understand it. I mean, I've seen the films of those guys playing and, the, and just the fury and the intensity of the live shows is just incredible. And then when you get some of the studio records, you're like, man, somebody overproduced this thing and took, yep. took the power away from these guys because the live performances are incredible. I mean, that's one of the things, like you were talking, let me give oh. you this unique perspective that no one has ever said, and I think this might be the first time I've, I've said it. I believe that the Stones were inspired by the MC5 to write Street Fighting Man. Oh, yeah. I believe, the Beatles, I believe the Beatles were inspired by the MC5 to write Revolution. Wow. Because all of a sudden, the Stones and the Beatles all of a sudden had these really uppity, and I, they were aware of the five. Um, yeah. So, so, be, so Beatles, 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 and Stones were meteoric, and then MC Five was doing a cultural explosion. But definitely, Stones and Beatles guys listened to them, and you think that I, influenced their energy? I believe you say you want a revolution, and they had a grittier guitar sound in the street fight. Man, yeah. oh, street fighting man! The Stones weren't street fighters. The Beatles weren't really revolution, except maybe extra dope and Maharishi, but they all of a sudden got like fighting mode. I attribute that to the influence of the MC5. An edge to it all, you know? I mean, yeah. that's, but that's what Detroit brings to it. I mean, you, you, you can't beat it. I mean, Black Keys in modern times. I mean, yep. there's nothing like it. You know, Eminem, nothing... Kid Rock, Ted Nugent. Oh, if, yeah. If, 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 I was just listening to Cowboy Upstairs sketching, you know? <laughs> uh, in, in closing Guys, thoughts. I, I really, I, I really got, I got stuff cooking on the stove. I don't want to burn my dinner. Um, yeah, bottom line is I'm, I'm pushing to explain to the world the vast array of, of, of what Wayne Kramer was, because I think a lot of people only see a small piece of that. And they don't know... A, a lot of Tom Morello know, knew him intimately and and, and uh, Jesse Hughes and a lot of people did that he was a loving man. Um, but I think my relationship with him is unique because we're both the exact same age um, from Detroit and our upbringing um, makes us, if I may, and I may, tighter blood brothers than anybody else. Yeah, because man. it broke my heart to see him stumble, and I, 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 I cursed him when I saw him throw it all away in the system that I knew would cause him to throw it away. I watched Jimmy die, watched Janice die, watched Jim die, watched John die, watched everybody die, and I'm watching these guys who I just revered. I didn't just admire them. I revered these guys. These guys were a, a torrent. It was scary. It was so inspiring. And then I watched him throw it away in the name of uh, Comfortably Numb. It just pissed me off to no end. So when he got out of prison, I immediately tracked him down to reignite that and see if I could help. And if uh, he was the Wayne Kramer I wanted him to be. Not that I have control or anybody has to be what I want, but I want I want everybody to be full and happy and, and healthy and and energized and that's what i want from everybody and i certainly wanted it from wayne kramer and i got it yeah and then you you Beautiful. see you see bands like the five it was just this magic recipe you know because some of the solo stuff was just never never the same magic as those guys i mean and i can relate 
even to what we did at, at Reebok with our design team. We were kind of like, we called ourselves the land of misfit toys because it was this team of people who didn't fit in anywhere else. But then when you put the magic together, crazy yep. came out of it. And then when one or two of us trickled away, it just died. And you can you can overlay it to the same kind of thing with that that magic moment in time, that perfect recipe, that perfect storm of talent. And to me, that's what the five was. You know, I was sitting there cranking away on those designs even back then at Reebok, listening to MC Five. I mean, come on! I mean, just it 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 was magic. And and Brother Wayne. I was so honored to meet him. Meet your heroes if you can. I mean, that's the same thing with with you and me, Ted, you know? I mean, the people who fired me up and made me want to design crazy stuff and and the music. Again, the music, there's nothing quite like it. I, th I think music is one of God's gifts to all of us. And, yep. uh, you know, wh whatever genre it is, it's a unifier and uniter. It's a, it's a dialogue like nothing else. Yep. Amen to that. Brother Wayne, uh, in, in, as I said to uh, Margaret last week, I said, in the wind, he's still alive. Yeah, I mean, and at, at, at the end of my Apple Pencil, it all still comes out as I'm sitting there sketching away, fired up. I mean, just the, the grit and the anger and, and just the energy is there. I mean, it fuels the designs like nothing else. I mean, I can't I, you can't explain it, you know. Yeah, they were fireballs, boy. <laughs> I, I appreciate y'all both for making the time. I know this is an incredible soul that touched our lives and will live forevermore. Uh, Dad, go get that dinner. Steve, appreciate y'all. Love y'all both. And uh, Wayne Kramer, rest in peace and live forever. Thank you, brother. Yeah, by the way, listen closely, Steve, to yeah. uh, Ramblin' Rose and the opening lick on Wango Tango. Oh, nice, nice. I'll definitely go back and listen to it all. Sounds all right, awesome. Guys. God bless you.